Hey, what's up guys? Happy to have you back for a brand new video. If you are new here, welcome. Today's case involves child abuse, sexual assault, and possibly cannibalism. I mean, it is a very disturbing case. And I know I say that about pretty much all of my videos, but this one just really really is disturbing, so just take my word for it. If you thought John Wayne Gacy was bad, then you really haven't met the twisted freak that I'm talking about today. So with that being said, viewer and listener, discretion is advised. The beginning of the story takes place in Worcester, Massachusetts, where Nathaniel Bar Jonah was formerly known as David Paul. Brown. For the sake of the story, we are only going to refer to him as Nathaniel, but we will talk about the moment in time where he did change his name to Nathaniel. Nathaniel Bar Jonah was born on February 15th, 1957. In the early years of Nathaniel's life, he was labeled as a very strange child. As far as siblings go, only one brother has ever really been talked about, but based on the information I gathered, they weren't ever really too close. Religion was a topic that was left in the air in Nathaniel's childhood home. His parents didn't belong or even believe in any specific religion, which explains why Nathaniel was able to do things like own a Ouija board from a very, very young age, and we will get to that momentarily. By the age of six, Nathaniel loved to pick at his scabs until his skin was septic. Even then, he would continue to suck the blood from his wound, and that often frightened his classmates and teachers. Multiple calls were made to Nathaniel's home, questioning why he did that, but his mother never really seemed to have a reasonable answer. One year later, in July of 1964, Nathaniel invited a five-year-old girl down to his basement after convincing her that he could predict the future with his Ouija board. Once they were downstairs, Nathaniel tackled her and started strangling her, and if it wasn't for Nathaniel's mother jumping into action to rescue the five-year-old girl, who knows what worse things could have happened. Although Nathaniel's mother stopped his son, she didn't seem to punish him, like, at all. This kick-started Nathaniel's mind to believe if he could get away with something like strangling a girl, then he could possibly get away with plenty more. By the age of 12, Nathaniel grew a very dark liking with torturing kids. In January of 1970, Nathaniel was able to lure one of his neighbors, a six-year-old boy, to a nearby hill after he convinced him to go sledding with him. They walked to the hill, padded up with their winter gear and sleds in hand. As they arrived to the hill, something dark took over Nathaniel's mind. Nathaniel dropped his sled and pushed the boy in an area where no one was around and continued to sexually assault the boy. A few years later, Nathaniel felt like he could get away with more than just sexually assaulting children. So, he befriended two boys who were riding bicycles together in the neighborhood. He tried to convince the boys to ride their bikes into the cemetery with him, but after one of the boys grew suspicious, both boys decided not to follow. The boy's intuition literally saved both boys because Nathaniel had planned to kill both of them if they had gone with him to the cemetery. Nathaniel seemed to carry a very uneventful life for a few years up until late March of 1975. Nathaniel was 18 years old now and was filled with an ominous curiosity for human torture. Eight-year-old Richard O'Connor was on his way to school when Nathaniel approached the boy in police attire. He convinced Richard he was a police officer and needed to come with him. In a matter of minutes, he had abducted Richard and proceeded to strangle him while sexually assaulted him. Fortunately, 
A neighbor who had been looking out her window noticed Nathaniel shoved Richard into his car. She called the police and a manhunt was now in full effect in hopes to find Richard O'Connor. With the help of another police officer, they located the vehicle that matched the description that was given. It was parked in a dark and secluded area within a parking lot. After more officers arrived to help, they approached the vehicle with caution and found Nathaniel in the vehicle. They ordered him to step out, and while a couple of officers handcuffed him, the others found Richard still in the back of the car. He was frail, bloodied, and had defecated and urinated on himself from the sexual assault. Although Richard was very close to dying, this entire situation only gave Nathaniel one year's worth of probation. It's very frustrating to hear. Had Nathaniel done this crime present day, he would have most likely received a much harsher sentence, ending any future sinister actions. But unfortunately, the story does not end here. A few days before Nathaniel graduated high school, he decided to drive to Hartford, Connecticut to once again impersonate a police officer. He caught the attention of a nine-year-old girl and had abducted her before anyone noticed, learning from his past mistakes. Mistakes. He strangled her and proceeded to sexually assault her. After Nathaniel was done, the young girl began to vomit and her body began to convulse because of the sexual assault. He hastily drove up to a sidewalk and threw the little girl out of the vehicle. Nathaniel sped away, thinking no one was a witness to what he had done. Thankfully, someone nearby saw Nathaniel drop the girl on the sidewalk and they were able to remember Nathaniel's license plate, which later led to his arrest. This specific assault never, okay, never got back to Nathaniel's probation officer. So in May of 1976, he was released from his parole for his earlier offense with Richard O'Connor. It gets even worse. When Nathaniel's probation sentence was over, he actually received a letter in the mail thanking him for his good behavior and cooperation. This mistake emboldened Nathaniel heavily and he really thought that he could do whatever he wanted in this world with little to no consequences following. September 24th, 1977. Nathaniel was now 20 years old and was morbidly obese. On the night of September 24th, Nathaniel dressed as an FBI agent and patiently waited outside White City Cinemas, located in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. News about a man impersonating a police officer had spread in the small town where Nathaniel lived. So he thought scouring a different city under a different uniform would keep him off the radar. He caught the attention of two boys who had just finished watching a movie and were leaving the cinema. They climbed inside Nathaniel's vehicle where he then proceeded to drive off into a remote area. Nathaniel handcuffed both boys and began torturing them. One of Nathaniel's methods of torture began with him jumping on top of one of the boys. Nathaniel's 375 pound body plummeted on the boy, stomping on his chest repeatedly until the boy lost consciousness. Nathaniel pretty much thought that he had killed the boy, so he decided to leave him in that remote area and proceeded to drive off with the other young boy boy still alive and in his trunk. The young boy, who went unconscious, eventually woke up in the spot where he was left in and miraculously was able to find help. As he was getting help, he explained the situation and police caught up to Nathaniel, with the young boy still in the trunk. He was arrested and then convicted of attempted murder and was given the highest penalty available at the time, which was 18 to 20 years in prison. 
while Nathaniel was doing his time in prison, he was actually transferred to Bridgewater State Hospital, where they housed the criminally deranged. March 22nd, 1984 was the day Nathaniel had officially changed his name. If you recall, in the beginning of this video, I did say he was formerly known as David Paul Brown, but now he went by Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Barr Jonah. He confided in friends that he changed his name because he wanted to know what it would feel like to be discriminated against and persecuted as a Jew. But then he contradicts himself a little and then says he was always a Jew and he just wanted his name to pretty much reflect that. Nathaniel grew very fond of the hospital and he began pretty much entrusting some of the psychiatrists and therapists who would often evaluate him. He confessed that he had quote murderous and cannibalistic ideations end quote. One therapist wrote quote Jonah's sexual fantasies, bizarre in nature, outline methods of torture, and extend to dissection and cannibalism, and again, express a curiosity about the taste of human flesh." End quote. During the same year, in 1984, Superior Court Judge Walter E. Steele ruled that the state of Massachusetts had failed to provide concrete evidence that would prove Nathaniel was dangerous to society, and so the judge released him. After his release, Nathaniel continued living in Massachusetts, where more than a handful of people recognized him as a monster. One month after his release from the hospital, on August 9th, 1991, Nathaniel was people-watching in a post office parking lot. He spotted a seven-year-old boy inside a car. The little boy waited alone as his mother was inside the post office. Nathaniel charged at the car where the boy was in, opened the door, and sat on the seven-year-old child. The little boy, weighing less than 100 pounds, was engulfed by Nathaniel, who now weighed 275 pounds. Witnesses, along with the young boy's mother, ran to save the seven-year-old. In an attempt to check on the boy's well-being, no one noticed that Nathaniel had fled. It was only after some time had passed that a police officer recognized him from a description that was made 15 years earlier and had him arrested. During this whole situation, Nathaniel was making his move to Great Falls, Montana. When he settled into this new city, the processing of his punishment for the post office situation had been completed. Nathaniel was only sentenced to probation in Montana. These are just my two cents, but if you have a criminal that is so foul and so heinous, you would think they would put some sort of hold to him even moving, especially since he was moving states. Anyway, among the victims Nathaniel had, one of them woke up the nation. A cry so loud, officials had to act on it. Nathaniel was now living in Great Falls, Montana. Great Falls was Montana's largest growing city from 1950 up until the early 1980s. Home to many good things, Nathaniel stayed. If there was any bad thing about Great Falls, it would be Nathaniel's sick desire for abusing more victims. On February 6th, 1996, 10-year-old Zachary Ramsey left his parents' apartment around 7.34 a.m. to get to Witter School. It was always the same morning route. Zach would enter through an alleyway near 400 block of North 4th Street. Zach was spotted that day by a family who lived in an apartment near the alleyway he took. It was a normal day until the family spotted an off-white four-door car try to run Zach over. Zach continued his walk where someone else saw him and he looked like he was waiting for someone. Meanwhile, around 7.15 a.m., a witness recalled seeing Nathaniel dressed in a navy blue police-like jacket standing next to a dumpster in the same alley Zach was walking in. At 7.45, Zach was spotted walking, but this time, 
he wasn't alone. Zack looked unsettled and very stressed as Nathaniel walked a few feet behind him. It's said in reports that Nathaniel actually had a taser behind Zack in case he like tried to run away, but that hasn't really been confirmed. So that's pretty much left in the air for you to believe or not. Somewhere between where the alley cuts into 6th Street and comes out at 7th, Zach vanished. Zachary never made it to school and February 6th, 1996 marked the last time anyone really knew about his whereabouts. He was last seen wearing a blue denim jacket with green sleeves, a blue football jersey with his last name Ramsey imprinted on the back in gold letters, stonewashed jeans, and black high top sneakers. This story made headlines across the state. I mean, it wasn't really normal for Montana to experience crimes this severe. Otherwise, children wouldn't be roaming around so freely. Officers searched high and low after Zachary's mother filed a missing persons report. But after so many continuous searches, nothing ever came up. At least, not yet. On the same day Zach went missing, Nathaniel coincidentally had the day off and was not working on the days leading up to Zach's disappearance. The whereabouts of Nathaniel after Zach went missing are a little unclear until years later when police concluded the off-white four-door car witnesses saw almost run Zach over matched the car that belonged to Nathaniel's mother. The day of Zachary's disappearance, Nathaniel's mother and brother were out of town for a funeral, concluding Nathaniel was the one using the vehicle that day. With this information, they were able to make a move on Nathaniel. Police obtained a search warrant for Nathaniel's apartment, whom he shared with two other people. Upon the search, detectives found a list of boys' names, which included many of his previous victims, but also included Zachary Ramsey. His name was followed by the word died. There were a total of 22 names. Eight of them were known to be Nathaniel's previous victims. The rest were children of the local area, and there were a few who were never really identified, sadly. They continued their search and found many newspaper clippings that involved Zachary. Police talked to his roommates and also discovered there were articles of clothing that matched what Zach was wearing the day of the disappearance along with some bloody gloves. Another roommate of his explained that he would very randomly and excitingly bring up Zach in conversations which they found to be a little weird. The apartment was also filled with a lot of pictures of young children cut out from magazines. Police continued to find notebooks that were encoded in a language Nathaniel made up in order for it to be illegible to the average person. With the help of the FBI and after months of trying to decipher it, authorities were finally able to read it. The notebooks contained detailed descriptions on how to torture and eat children. Nathaniel went on to write macabre recipes involving children's body parts. As if this wasn't disturbing enough, based on financial records, it indicated that Nathaniel made little to no grocery purchases for almost a month after Zachary disappeared. Nathaniel was 300 pounds and a compulsive eater, so this led many officials to believe Nathaniel ate Zachary Ramsey. He could have paid with cash when he went to buy groceries or he could have very well been stocked with food for that long. But what makes it more probable that Nathaniel ate Zach was when Nathaniel started hosting cookouts sometime after Zach went missing. According to people who attended, Nathaniel cooked burgers, spaghetti, chili, meat pies, casseroles, and anything else that was requested by the guests. During these cookouts, a lot of people told Nathaniel that the meat had a very weird taste to it. One woman straight up said that the meat was repulsive in Nathaniel's face. 
Nathaniel explained that he was using deer meat in all of his dishes, but records later showed Nathaniel never had a hunting license and he never even went deer hunting. This is a little bit of a side note, but Nathaniel did go on and abuse the lady's son later on, the lady who said the meat was repulsive. Nathaniel titled his recipes, quote, little boy pot pie or French fried kid, along with some eerie phrases such as, Lunch is served on the patio with roasted child. Nathaniel owned a meat grinder, and upon investigating, police found hair that resembled that of a black boy, but it didn't match Zachary or the set of bones they found in Nathaniel's garage. Not a lot is really known about the bone findings in his garage, other than they found bones in the garage. Police continued to spray Nathaniel's garage with a phosphorus chemical, which would later reveal the name Tita inside his property. This led officials to believe Nathaniel was probably involved with the abduction of James Tita, who was a boy from the state of Massachusetts back in August of 1973. James's body was recovered in New Hampshire off of Route 119. His cause of death was strangulation and sexual assault. Nathaniel maintained his innocence, claiming he never killed, he never ate Zach either. And unfortunately, there was not enough concrete evidence to prove Nathaniel was responsible for any sort of cannibalism. However, there's definitely enough circumstantial evidence to make one believe Nathaniel was involved with many heinous activities. With that being said, Zachary's mother was very, very persistent with finding her son and she didn't quite believe Nathaniel was responsible for his disappearance, despite all of the circumstantial evidence they found on him. Her optimism is truly admirable, but it unfortunately came with a cost. In 1999, Nathaniel Bar Jonah was once again impersonating a police officer while this whole investigation was literally in full effect. Given the earlier circumstance, police weren't able to arrest Nathaniel until they caught him legitimately doing something illegal, like impersonating a police officer. While being detained, police were able to find more evidence that would lead Nathaniel to be charged with kidnapping and sexual assault of three previous victims, along with the murder of Zach Ramsey. Prosecutors were now seeking the highest form of penalty, which was death. In court, Zachary's mother testified and told the jury she believed her son was still alive, which led them to pretty much not convict Nathaniel for the death of Zachary Ramsey. However, Nathaniel was convicted of kidnapping, aggravated assault, and sexual assault, including a charge that involved one of the three victims being tortured and hung on a hook from his kitchen ceiling. Mary Patrone was a woman who recognized Nathaniel in court as the man that had abducted and sexually assaulted her, but the statute of limitations had expired and Nathaniel was not charged for the crime, unfortunately. Like I said earlier, Nathaniel pretty much kept saying he was innocent throughout his entire investigation and even leading up to his conviction. Despite his beliefs, Nathaniel was sentenced to 130 years in prison. I don't even know how this happened, but apparently Montana courts were not aware of Nathaniel's criminal record back in Massachusetts. Nathaniel tried to appeal his case like many criminals try to do, but the courts were smart enough to deny his appeal. On the morning of April 13th, 2008, Nathaniel was found unconscious in his prison cell. It seemed like he had died sometime before the morning. His cause of death was myocardial infarction. Nathaniel was 300 pounds, so it didn't really come as a shocker to the public. This is sort of a 
side note, but in 2008, Zachary's father approved to have Zachary declared dead, despite his mother's opinion on it, and they could now claim their life insurance policy. If you made it this far, I really hope you're doing okay because I know that this case was brutal in every way possible. Even though the story had a few gray areas, I just know it was a heavy case for you guys. Also, if you made it this far, comment disturbing in the comment section down below. If you like these kinds of videos, let me know by hitting the thumbs up button. This gesture goes a very long way and helps push out my content. If you are not subscribed and you enjoy my content, then you should really subscribe so you don't miss out on any future posts. Thank you so much for the continuous support. Believe me when I say that it does not go unnoticed. That's all the content I have for you guys this week. So with that being said, stay safe and take care of one another and I will see you guys next time.